Okay, so then welcome back to the, our uh, second session on <clears throat> the territorial compound states and judicial functions in federal systems. And we have again three uh, ladies uh, presenting, as I, as I may say so, only for the gender issue, as we have already said uh, this morning, which is a particular pleasure. We have um, uh, in Skype, let's start with our Skype connection, Jacqueline. Uh, Ling Chen Neo from the National University uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh, she is an assistant professor and uh, is dealing especially with issues of constitutional uh, law, institutions, constitutional theory, uh, state and religion, but also minority rights, migrants, <coughs> and uh, will tell us about uh, the organization um, of the judiciary in Malaysia and Singapore. We have anticipated her talk in order to have these uh, technical things and also because of the time issues. It's very good that you are online. Thank you for the PowerPoint presentation and hello in particular from Roberto Tognatti. <coughs> uh, the next speaker afterwards will be uh, Cheryl Saunders. Uh, uh, Professor Saunders uh, is um, of course very well known and is already here uh, for the third week. Uh, and has taught a course in comparative federalism. And <clears throat> it's a particular pleasure to have her here uh, with, uh, with us. Uh, she's, of course, as you all know, um, an expert in comparative constitutional law. She's actually the founding director of the Center for Comparative Constitutional uh, Studies at the University of Melbourne and has held the presidency of important comparative law uh, associations, many of them, so I won't list them uh, all. Uh, which uh, is a, really a particular pleasure to have her here. And uh, she will, uh, due to the fact that she's such an expert, not only engage today, but also tomorrow with a presentation in this conference. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much. And then I have a particular pleasure uh, to welcome also um, Alexandra Trotskaya, who is an associate professor at the Department of Constitutional and Municipal Law at the Law Faculty of the Moscow State University Lomonosov, and uh, she's um, <clears throat> actually, uh, she has dealt with uh, constitutional legal limitations and restrictions of freedom of the individual and the public authorities in a, in a book, uh, which she published in 2008, and uh, she is teaching constitutional law, constitutional law of Russia, but also uh, local self-government, municipal law. <clears throat> so these are the issues, and uh, this is a, a perfect uh, foundation for uh, a, a paper which she will present on the organization of the uh, federal Russian, uh, of the Russian Federation, sorry, and the implications which uh, the federal structure in Russia has uh, on the judiciary, because uh, again, I'd like to remind, this is the topic, now we are switching from indi uh, indigenous peoples, but we had already some overlap uh, in the last part with regard to uh, Australia, now we're switching to the federal systems and to the question of uh, how pluralism uh, in territorial terms plays out uh, on the principle always of unity and uniformity of uh, jurisdictions. So, uh, thank you. For your attention, we will have a, um, a coffee break probably after the second uh, presentation. Uh, and now we will hopefully hear Jacqueline with her presentation. We will help here with the moving of the PowerPoint slides. And please, Jacqueline, uh, take the floor. I hope that you could follow uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. So um, first, I just want to thank Roberto, Jens, and the organizing committee for um, their indulgence in allowing me to present my paper remotely. Um, secondly, I would like to apologize to all of you for not being there in person, and I do hope that I will have other opportunities to meet with all of you personally, and that we can continue the conversation that this excellent conference is bringing up. Um, Jens, if, I am, if um, you're losing me, can you just let me know? Okay, but now um, so perfect. my presentation today focuses on what I call mixed legal systems. These are legal systems that comprise both religious and non-religious courts. And the aim here is to start a discussion on how such mixed systems have worked or not worked, how they've interacted with each other. And I'm here using Malaysia and Singapore as key examples. So next slide. Let me illustrate 
Some of you may recall the supposed reformasi movement in Malaysia in 1998. Now, at this time, Malaysia was in political crisis. Then Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim was sacked from his post and he was tried for corruption and sodomy offences. Now, he was the leader of this uh, so-called reformasi movement or Refo reformation movement. And it's, it sought to challenge um, Dr. Mahathir's administration. Um, you can see here... Anwar speaking to a large crowd, him on the Time magazine cover, and him being escorted by the police. Next slide, please. Now, what I want to focus on is actually not on Anwar, but in a case that emerged from the sodomy accusations. Now, his alleged sodomy victim and primary prosecution witness is Sukna Damawan. Um, he was charged with gross indecency in a separate indictment and he was convicted and sentenced to six months imprisonment under the Malaysian Penal Code. Now, Damawan later challenged his conviction and sentence on constitutional grounds. In his application for habeas corpus, he argued that the court had no jurisdiction to try and convict him because it was a matter that fell within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts, the religious courts. And he relied on a very controversial provision in the Malaysian constitution which says that the high courts shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Next slide. Now, this is how his argument goes. Since the act of sodomy, when committed by a Muslim, is also a crime under Sharia law, he argued that he ought to have been tried in the Sharia court instead. So in other words, he, his claim is that although the secular, supposedly secular high courts have territorial jurisdiction over the matter since the act was committed in Malaysia where the penal code applies, his argument is that because he's a Muslim, the Sharia courts have personal jurisdiction over him, and he is subject to the rules of the Sharia legal system, and so he should be tried under the Sharia laws, and the fact that he was charged and tried in the High Court was unconstitutional. I should also point out, interestingly, this normative overlap between the supposedly secular criminal laws and religious criminal laws with respect to this issue of sodomy. Now, there is a difference in the prescribed punishments, of course. Under the, uh, under the, the penal code, um, the law could attract a higher uh, penalty that as compared to under the Sharia laws. Um, next slide, please. Now, the big question is this. Under such circumstances, which court should have jurisdiction over the matter? Um, next slide. Well, in this case, the High Court denied Damawan um, his habeas corpus application, and this was also affirmed by the Court of Appeal and the Federal Court. Now, what is interesting is how the Court came to this conclusion. The Court said that Article 1211A, despite its clear words, did not oust the jurisdiction of the courts over crimes which are covered under the Penal Code. Uh, such crimes, according to the courts, um, belong to the concurrent jurisdiction of these courts, of both the Sharia courts and the non uh, and the secular light courts. Um, but there was a safeguard, which, and this was the fact that he could not be prosecuted and punished twice for the same offence. But this is very interesting. What does that mean then? Does it mean that jurisdiction um, ceases? Some uh, the uh, the court that gets there first gets jurisdiction. And that is the only way that we can resolve this jurisdictional conflict. That's very interesting. Now, next slide, please. Now, I raised the Damawan case to illustrate some of the complexities of um, a legally pluralistic or a mixed legal system. Now, here, the core issue is that there are two systems of laws and two systems of courts operating within the state structure. What is interesting is what is the relationship between the two systems of law and the two systems of courts? How do we allocate cases with, that fall within the overlapping or concurrent jurisdictions? 
Next slide. Now, I should mention that um, I'm not saying that jurisdictional allocation is a problem entirely unique to mixed legal systems. Um, of course, in many situations, a common solution is to prescribe a hierarchy of courts, whereby um, the highest court always has jurisdiction over all matters, and it exercises appellate or supervisory jurisdiction over all inferior tri tribunals. But the question is, where there's no clear hierarchy, is that possible? Can a legal system without a hierarchy be stable? And so, even if it is stable, what kind of problems would we face? Next slide. So, the paper uh, seeks to highlight some of these issues using the example of Malaysia and Singapore. Now, Malaysia and Singapore um, have um, common historical background in terms of how their courts are organized, but they've gone in very divergent ways. While Malaysia has sought to allocate jurisdictions and give the two systems of courts and law equal standing, thereby creating what I call a coordinate system, Singapore, on the other hand, has firmly rejected this, instead reinforced a hierarchy of laws where the religious courts, religious laws remain subject to the um, higher and more universal jurisdiction of the secular courts. In other words, they are not of equal standing to the secular civil courts. Now, um, next slide, please. You'll notice that in addressing this phenomenon, I've actually used the term make legal system rather than plural legal system. Um, let me explain and elaborate a little bit on this and also highlight some of the analytical limitations of this. Next slide. Now, um, the mixed legal system um, really is a pluralistic system of laws. It is a type of legal pluralism, and um, I just want to highlight what Basilei has uh, emphasized with regards to legal pluralism. is one of um, the academic trends in law and society scholarship, the most salient and influential one. It um, very interestingly articulates detachment from legal centralism, revolving around state law. It criticizes um, the exclusiveness of state law. Um, it seeks to um, provide, to take away from court-centered judicial studies. And it seeks to explore non-state legal orders, unveil informal social practices, and um, to see law as a multi-centered field, and so on. Now, there are actually several types of arrangements that could be identified as legally pluralistic. Next slide. Um, here, William, Ty William Twining has actually nicely identified three main types of legal pluralism. First is what he calls legal polycentricity, where different sources of law are often invoked but within one legal system. The second type is uh, what is known as weak or state legal system, where there is recognition um, by a state legal system of religious or customary law for limited purposes. The third is um, often I, I find scholars seem to regard this as legal pluralism proper, which refers to the phenomena of two or more autonomous or semi-autonomous legal orders coexisting, and there seems to be an emphasis on their at least one of these being a non-state legal order. Next slide. Now, um, the mixed legal system, which I've, uh, the, uh, the one that I'm identifying, well, firstly, it refers to institutionalized legal orders. So it's not non-state orders. Um, we conceptualize them as individuated systems, but they coexist and interrelate within a single state structure. Um, in the specific context that I'm looking at, uh, we can loosely characterize uh, the systems as being secular on one hand and religious on the other. Now, commonly speaking, um, they would fall within what Twining has identified as weak or state legal pluralism. I wanted to move away from these, this, these two terms for a few reasons. Um, I find that um, State legal pluralism or weak legal pluralism often identifies these religious or customary law as having very limited um, scope. 
However, as my research shows and um, the discussion on Malaysia will show this, I think, is that the recognition of religious laws may be limited at first, but it's not necessarily fixed in its limitations. Secondly, um, I wonder if the label weak legal pluralism could even be taken to suggest a tendency to regard this type of legal pluralism as being less interesting. You know, it's not the strong form and therefore not the most interesting to investigate um, and so on. Now, um, I should also emphasize, of course, that the mixed legal system, the one that I've identified, it's not legal polycentricity, even though it also, like in the legal polycentric system, exists within a single state structure. Next slide, please. Um, now, before going on, I should also emphasize some of the analytical limitations of trying to discuss this mixed legal system. I am aware that when we discuss the Sharia courts and the Sharia law as applied in, by the Malaysian and the Singaporean state, is not necessarily reflective of the heterogeneity that is present in Islamic law. There's a lot of complexities in interpretation and in traditions within the Sharia law, but this is not all captured when Sharia laws are codified and applied by the state, and I'm aware of that. But I think that um, it is still relevant and necessarily necessary to examine these codified rules and practices on their own terms and to look at how codification and bureaucratization of Islamic law in these states have affected um, the way religion is also understood in these countries. Um, again, I will emphasize that um, I'm not saying that the law as applied necessarily reflects actual social practices in these countries, but they are the law and they have legal authority, and that's why we should look at them. Next slide. Um, so let me go on to Malaysia. Then. Next slide on Malaysia. Now, Malaysia is a federation of 13 states and three federal territories. It's a former British colony. It received a common law. Uh, where there was a colony and that has um, continued. The independence constitution, the federal constitution of Malaysia, prescribes a parliamentary democracy as a form of government, but at the same time it also establishes Islam as a religion of the federation under Article 3.1. Now there's a lot of disagreement about what this article really means, um, specifically whether it um, authorizes the use of Islamic rites and rituals, which is a very narrow reading, or does it mean that um, Malaysia is an Islamic state in the sense that Islamic norms are extra-constitutional, such that it should govern all forms of law within the state, which would be a very expensive view of Article 3.1? These are disagreements that uh, remain contested in Malaysia. Next slide, please. But looking, going back to Islam in the um, constitutional order, um, it is actually designated under the constitution as a state matter. Um, list 2, read with Article 74, actually authorizes state legislatures to enact religious laws on personal and family law of persons professing the religion of Islam. It also allows for the um, enactment of offenses against the precepts of Islam. Um, under the various states, um, Remember, with 13 states, the various state enactments um, provide for um, Sharia laws, Sharia bureaucracies, um, certain Islamic bureaucracies that um, are commonly set up are the Majlis Ugama Islam, the Council of Muslim Religion, includes some religious departments within it, the Sharia courts and the Mufti. Um, the, the constitution also says that the heads of each state um, we have Malay sultans who are heads of the state, are uh, also the heads of Islam. Next slide. Now, in its original design, 
the religious legal system was in fact conceptualized as limited and subject to the general non-religious legal system. And one can see this from the 1965 Sharia Court's Criminal Jurisdiction Act. It, it circumscribes the jurisdiction of the Sharia Courts only to persons professing Islam. It, pres it, it limits um, which means that it limits uh, the jurisdiction of the courts. It also limits the jurisdiction of the courts um, such that the maximum punishments that the court can order are three-year imprisonment, a $5,000 uh, ringgit fine, and all six strokes of the key. Well, you should contrast this with the high courts, which do not have such limits uh, with respect to the jurisdiction. Next slide. However, the past 20 or so years, uh, we've seen increasing contestation as to the proper role and relationship between these two legal systems. Um, the contestation is judicialized because of Article 1211A of the Federal Constitution, which was introduced in 1988. This article, which, which I highlighted earlier, is part of this constitutional provision addressing judicial power in the Federation. Here, um, one to one, one says there shall be two high courts of coordinate jurisdiction status. One to one, one a, which is a controversial one, says that uh, the courts referred to in clause one, the high courts and the inferior courts shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Now, what is the impact of this? Does that mean that they are now courts of coordinate status? And this has real impact in terms of um, how the cases are resolved. And one important area of law where this article has become the focal point of dispute is in the area of religious freedom. Now, Article 11.1 of the Federal Constitution of Malaysia guarantees every person the right to profess and practice his religion and subject to clause 4 to propagate it. Now, um, there has been a strong divergence in views as to what this particular article protects. Um, what we can loosely um, characterize as a secularist or more or liberal position, if you like, is that religious freedom surely includes the right to choose one's uh, religion and to leave a religion if one so wishes. The more conservative and sometimes and what would be considered Islamist position is that. Well, religious freedom does not include the right to choose one's religion or to leave one's religion when it comes to Islam. Next slide. Now, the seminal case on this issue is actually a 1999 case um, of Sun Singh. Here, um, uh, uh, the applicant was born a Hindu. He converted to Islam, and then uh, he wanted to convert back to Hinduism. And he wanted the secular, the high courts, to uh, recognize that he is no longer a Muslim. Now, the Supreme Court of Malaysia and the highest court said that, well, a Muslim's personal status is a matter that fell within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. And so only a Sharia court can determine whether a person is or is no longer a Muslim. And this is because, well, it has to be determined according to the internal rules of Islam. And so the Supreme Court declined jurisdiction on the basis of Article 1211A. It, it basically, it, the court was telling the applicant, you have to go back to the Sharia court to determine whether or not you're Muslim. And if you want recognition that you're no longer a Muslim, please go to the Sharia court. Now, interestingly, the the Supreme Court said that, well, this doesn't violate Sun Singh's religious freedom because there was yet no determination whether or not he can convert out, which is asking him to go to the Sharia court. Well, next slide. That may be so, but if you look at the laws, and increasingly this is the case, there does not seem to be a legal pathway for Muslims to properly convert out of Islam. 
In the past, there were some provisions providing for some um, legal procedures for conversion out, but these were later on taken, um, removed from the state enactments. So the the um, Supreme Court's um, instruction to for Sun Singh to go back to the Sharia court seems rather um, illusory if there's no legal pathway for conversion out. And at the same time, if you look at some of the state enactments, it actually authorizes the Sharia courts to detain a person wishing to convert out of Islam for rehabilitation. And this rehabilitation can go up to three years. Um, so that's very interesting what the Supreme Court seems to be suggesting, that there's no violation of one's religious freedom. Um, one should also see these um, what's happening here um, in terms of developments within the Sharia legal system. There's been an expansion um, procedurally and substantively whereby the, um, there seems to be an increasing number of um, Sharia laws that um, cover various conduct of Muslims. Now, very interestingly, you also see that there is, well, whereas in Sun Sing, what the court did was to rely on jurisdictional allocation. But if you look at later cases, for instance, a very famous, infamous, if you like, the case of Lena Joy, you see a very conservative strand of jurisprudence in within supposedly secular courts, non-religious courts. For instance, in this case, the Court of Appeal actually said that renunciation of Islam is a grave matter, and Muslims regard it to be their responsibility to save another Muslim from the damnation of apostasy. Now, this is very interesting coming from a non-religious court. Um, in a 2015 article, I noted this normative convergence uh, between the religious and non-religious courts in Malaysia. Um, next slide, please. Well, such legal uncertainty um, have also arisen in custody cases in Malaysia. Now, uh, the 2007 case of Subashini actually entails increasingly common uh, facts. You have a Hindu couple here, the husband converted to Islam. He then unilaterally converts the child or the children to Islam. Question, which court has jurisdiction? Which court has jurisdiction over the custody and over whether or not the child is Muslim? So this is a little bit more tricky because here you have one uh, Muslim applicant, uh, one Muslim litigant and one non-Muslim litigant. Um, the federal court's judgment in this case was rather unsatisfactory in my view. It said that both courts have jurisdiction. The Sharia courts are not of lower status than uh, the civil courts, but of equal standing. Um, and so both courts can decide the matter. Well, okay, but what if you have conflicting judgments? How do we resolve this? Um, in the 2010 article, Amanda Whiting noted that in this case, the court really sta restated the jurisdictional problem more starkly without resolving it at all. Now, the difficulty that one could envisage with regards to conflicting judgments is actually a real one. And that currently, um, arising from this case of Indira Gandhi, which was decided in 2013, um, you have two courts, the High Court giving um, one uh, judgment in favor of the Hindu wife, the Shira Court giving custody in favor of the husband who had converted to Islam, which should be, which one should prevail. Now, the High Court actually ordered the um, husband to return the child and, the ch and, and he has refused. And the High Court has now asked the police to enforce the, uh, the contempt order. But the police in Malaysia, in fact, the police chief came out and said, well, we're sandwiched between the two legal systems, so we will not enforce the civil court's decisions. And in fact, we will, not gen we will generally not enforce civil court decisions when there's a child custody dispute where one par parent has embraced Islam, because we simply can't. So now you have this problem where you have two judgments and um, they cannot be enforced. Next slide, please. 
Um, I just at this stage also wanted to um, highlight that um, there is an analytical framework that hasn't actually been commonly applied to these conflicts, and this is the federal state uh, framework. Um, there's a historical basis for this, I think, because uh, when Malaysia tried, or when the drafters um, in the negotiations tried to include Article 3.1, which um, says that Islam is a religion of the Federation, the Malay Sultans actually rejected this um, inclusion initially. And this was because they were concerned that this would open the door for the central government to interfere with um, affairs of Islam within the state. And so um, this is, I think, not an um, unwarranted concern. Um, there have been some interesting legal developments that deal with these, uh, with the question of state versus federal powers. Um, the 2012 case of Fatubari addresses the question of whether the criminalization of the teaching of Islam without credentials is within state power, and the court here taking a very uh, wide view of precepts of Islam said yes, it is within state power. But the more interesting case is actually one that just came out. This was um, a case brought by a, f uh, a group of transgender Muslims. Um, in the state of the Greece of Milan, one of the constituent states, um, the state actually enacted Sharia laws which criminalized cross-dressing by men. Um, here the Court of Appeal said that yes, it's within the competence of the state, but the competence of the state must still be subject to constitutional limits. And so it struck down the law as being in violation of the right to life, equality, freedom of movement, and freedom of expression. The case is currently being appealed to the federal court, and hopefully it will stand. Next slide. Now, um, I've discussed extensively some of the difficulties experienced in Malaysia with regards to this mixed system and the attempt to coordinate, to create courts of coordinate status within this system. Let's go to Singapore as a compar very quick comparative. Um, Singapore was actually a constituent state of the Federation of Malaysia for two years. It was a former British colony like Malaysia. Um, it has a significant Muslim minority, as opposed to Malaysia, which had, has a Muslim majority of about 60%. Now, under the Constitution of Singapore, Article 153 actually authorizes the legislature to make laws regulating Muslim religious affairs and to constitute a council to advise the president in matters of Muslim religion. And this was the base, this is the basis for the uh, enactment called the Administration of Muslim Law Act. It codifies um, some religious laws and uh, creates um, some state bureaucracies to administer uh, religious laws in Singapore. Um, one of them, the main one is Majlis Ugama Islam Singapura, which is the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, or MUIS for short, and um, Sharia courts, uh, which administer religious laws, Sharia laws. Interestingly, Sharia courts are quite oddly positioned. They're somewhat of an anomaly in the Singapore constitutional order. They're not actually part of the judiciary but they are under the purview of the Ministry of Social and Family Development. Um, and this is despite the fact that they are recognized and called courts and have the power to adjudicate over disputes arising from Islamic family laws. Um, appeals from, however, the appeals are made to the Sharia Appeals Board. It's administered by the Islamic Religious Council. Um, the cases are not appealable to the Singapore Court of Appeal. Nonetheless, um, the status of Sharia courts within, as courts of Islamic law has never been really challenged. And in practice, um, it seems like they are treated somewhat like district courts or the Islamic counterpart to the family courts. Next slide. Um, now, the relative status of the Sharia courts within the legal system did in fact become rather important uh, 
issues during the 1990s, much like in Malaysia. Now, before it was amended, Section 16 of the Singapore Court of Judicature Act actually contained uh, wordings that are quite similar to Article 1211A. Here it says that the High Court shall have no jurisdiction to hear and try any civil proceedings which comes within the jurisdiction of the Sharia Court constituted under the Administration of Muslim Law Act. So it's very similar to 1211A. Now the impact of this section became an issue in the 1990s in several custody cases, custody and um, divorce ancillary questions pertaining to divorce cases. There's a 1990 case of Mohamed Munir where the High Court had to consider whether it had the jurisdiction to hear a custody dispute that arose out of a Muslim marriage. So a Muslim marriage, a custody dispute, commonly will come under the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Here, the court actually said that, well, it's not exclusive jurisdiction. The High Court asserted that it had concurrent jurisdiction, and this is how it reasoned it. It said that before Amla, the High Court had exclusive jurisdiction because of the guardianship of infants act. After Amla, Amla doesn't take away our jurisdiction. It merely requires us to share jurisdiction. So there's concurrent jurisdiction, despite what Section 16 says. Next uh, slide, please. There were later cases, however, where the courts um, started to depart from this position of concurrent jurisdiction and seemed to favour the idea of exclusive jurisdiction. And there is some evidence that they were influenced by developments in Malaysia. Now, the case of Salija, a 1995 case, um, this involved um, the visual matrimonial property and the enforcement of it. It was a Muslim couple, they had divorced, and uh, they got a decree from the Sharia court, which contains ancillary orders. Um, the wife, however, uh, was unable to enforce the orders because her husband became uncontactable. So she filed an application with the High Court to enforce the order by way of declaration, but the High Court refused to the High Court refused to enforce the order on the basis that this was a matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. And because of Section 16, the civil court's jurisdiction was ousted. Now, the court said, well, you know, the Sharia court is a court of competent jurisdiction. It would be against public policy for the High Court to judge the validity of enforced judgment of a coordinate court. It would unnecessarily undermine the standing of the Sharia court if the court were to do so, and opposed to the aim of Parliament, which is to set up a court administered to Muslims completely outside the court system established by the SJA. So here, if you if uh, here you can see the hints of Article One Two One One A and the ideas under Sun saying, which is it's outside the jurisdiction, it's outside the system of the High Court. Next slide. Well. The response from the Singapore government was rather different. Um, it sought to remove Section 16 of the ICJA to an asserted concurrent jurisdiction of the civil and Sharia courts over all ancillary matters arising from divorce. The justification that the government gave was interesting. It said that this is necessary to ensure that Muslims have equal access to the high courts as non-Muslims. Well, to um, preclude any allegations of religious persecution, uh, a select committee was uh, convened to receive um, representations of the bill. And notably, many Muslim, Malay Muslim groups actually oppose the uh, removal of Section 16 and oppose the, um, the proposed amendments um, because it said that if we allow for concurrent jurisdiction without increasing the powers and manpower of Sharia courts, this will dilute its status because it would just be more efficient for Muslim couples to go to the civil courts. Also, um, it would stultify the development of Islamic law. And for some, it was just entirely undesirable 
for civil courts to hear disputes uh, between Muslim couples because they may apply secular principles and values and these could contradict Sharia laws. Next slide. Now, those of you who are familiar with Singapore uh, would not be, I think, surprised that the amendment was passed. Um, but it was passed with some accommodation, um, which includes the fact that parties can choose whether to commence or continue civil proceedings. And the uh, Sharia courts retain exclusive jurisdiction over certain matters, such as validity and dissolution of Muslim marriages. Um, they did provide for increased powers for Sharia courts, which includes the power to sign documents on behalf of errant spouses. This was uh, what came up in Salija in the first place. And it gave the Sharia court a gatekeeping role. It gave the Sharia court um, the, right, the, the, the power to grant leave to continue or commence proceedings in the civil courts. What this means is that when couples uh, want to go, want to bring a matter, uh, an ancillary matter before the civil courts as opposed to the Sharia court, they have to obtain leave from the Sharia court. Now, if both parties um, mutually agree, the court will defer to the Sharia, uh, to, the, to their choice. But if one objects, then the Sharia court has an important function in determining whether the matter should be um, transferred in the, to the civil courts. And this gatekeeping function is supposed to strengthen the Sharia justice system. Next slide. Um, in my view, the amendments uh, in asserting concurrent jurisdiction actually asserted the hierarchy of law and courts because it affirmed, on the one hand, that civil courts have um, universal non-limited uh, non jurisdiction within the territory and asserts and affirms the Sharia courts only have limited jurisdiction, which it shares mostly with the civil courts. Also, later developments do highlight the prioritization of secular religious uh, civil jurisdiction and laws over these Sharia laws. For instance, the 2010 case of Shafiq, um, this case was, the question in this case was whether um, the real property held in joint tenancy by two Muslims, uh, when one dies, does it form part of the uh, estate of the Muslim person? This is because um, under Islamic law, um, in the inheritance um, can only be distributed in a particular fashion. Now, um, in common law, uh, joint tenancies, uh, property held in joint tenancies do not form part of the deceased estate. Um, but under the right of survivorship, it goes directly to the remaining joint tenants. Um, Islamic law does not uh, recognize joint tenancy or or rights to survivorship and will treat the property as forming part of the estate. It will be distributed according to the rules of inheritance. Now here, interestingly, the Court of Appeal, the Civil Court, decided that the common law actually preceded the Sharia laws of inheritance, which means that it would be governed by the common law right of survivorship and not Sharia laws. Interestingly, it also rejected a legal ruling from the Islamic Religious Council on this matter, the fatwa essentially, for those who know this, uh, which says that, um, which essentially decided that um, the, the, the property that would come under, would be part of the estate. The Court of Appeal rejected this and um, included a little note, which says, we hope that Moise will take note of our observation. The implication seems to be that the Sharia legal system has to conform to the prevailing legal position in the secular legal system. Next slide. Um, and then the next slide. Now, just some concluding reflections. It's clear that despite relatively similar starting points in terms of the design, Malaysia and Singapore have taken divergent approaches in dealing with issues of conflict within their mixed legal systems. While Malaysian law and the courts have sought to give coordinate status to Sharia courts, Singapore approach has been to essentially assert um, hierarchy, whereby Sharia courts are regarded effectively as lower tribunals. Now, the hierarchy um, seems to have ensured some stability in the legal system since it allows for final authority to be located. The Malaysian system, um, however, appears to be, one might say, increasingly unstable. Um, the as the Indira Gandhi case where the police has refused to enforce a contempt order by the High Court, 
The question is, are we seeing a fragmentation of the legal order and will this continue? And how, what is the judicial approach going forward? Um, how can the judiciary address these um, issues that have arisen because of this um, attempt to coordinate um, the civil courts um, in terms of their status to the Sharia courts? Last slide, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. This was a, a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you also for the comparative approach, which I think uh, helps us very, uh, very much, uh, in particular also uh, the issue of uh, what you have also pointed out in your final <coughs> uh, conclusion, the coordinate, co coordinative approach vis the hierarchical approach. I think this is something we also have to discuss with, with regard to other systems. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I okay. can. Okay, very good. And uh, my question would be, how, how, how much do you think is this also influenced by the fact of the minority-majority situation, which uh, you have pointed out in your, in your initial um, overview about the, the two countries? <clears throat> and then, in, in the meantime, uh, I look into the audience, whether there is someone else who wants to make a comment or give an opinion, and then we, I think, collect some, uh, ask you these questions, ask you kindly to reply, and then... We will proceed here, and you are free because it's late over there. <laughs> Should I um, first? Choose? Yeah, if you if you would like to, if you could give. Yeah. A... Okay. Um. Well, obviously, it's much easier for Singapore to pose a. High um, to take a hierarchical approach because systems are in Singapore. Um, but I don't think it's because we are in the majority of Asia, this hierarchical approach. Um, I didn't change anything. Do you think it's because people are mute just now and so there's no move? Uh, I think it's because people are mute just now and so there's no move. I that um the Okay, I was just saying that the fact that the Muslim uh, community are in the minority position in um, Singapore does, in some ways, make it easier for the government um, to impose a hierarchical approach, um, for sure. But I don't think it precludes the Malaysian government or Malaysian state from also continuing with a hierarchical approach. Um, even if it's sought to give the Sharia courts more uh, powers and um, include, expand the jurisdiction, it could still do it without taking away the secular or civil court's final jurisdiction as the highest court of the land. But what it has done now is to create these, like, this, this fragmentation in the legal system an increasing fragmentation in the legal system, which then leads to the situation where we have two um, courts of coordinate status, two conflicting judgments, and no way of being resolved. So um, I think that giving the um, uh, effect to the fact that Muslims are in um, marginal majority uh, could have been done in different ways. So. Uh, this is Roberto. Thank you. I can't hear. Well, because I haven't started speaking. Oh, 
Now, can, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I, I have a question uh, which concerns what you did not say, so don't be angry because of that. Uh, I wonder uh, to what extent, uh, since you mentioned state uh, uh, weak uh, legal pluralism, uh, you didn't tell us anything about strong legal pluralism. In other words, to what extent, as far as you know and as far as it is detectable, is there a phenomenon of strong legal pluralism, in particular with regard to other communities that do exist in Singapore? My question is more concerned about Singapore than about uh, Ma Malaya. Uh, for instance, is there any sort of voluntary uh, recourse to Hindu courts, any voluntary recourse to uh, some mechanism for deciding controversies within the Chinese community. So in, in a way, this would make the situation in Singapore and perhaps in Malaya as well more complex than it is. In other words, we had a sort of uh, uh, legal and, and, uh, and official picture but perhaps there is even more. And then the final question is, if it is even more complex, will that ultimately, uh, go, is that ultimately going to affect the prevailing role of state courts, of civil courts, rather than community courts? Thank you. Thank you. Uh should I respond to this first? Okay. Thank you very much. Matthias Hartwig from Germany. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Are there any uh, constitutional or secular principles, be it in uh, Malaysia or in Singapore, which will govern the exercise of uh, jurisdiction of Muslim jurisdiction in both states? Are there principles which uh, uh, limit, in a way, the exercise of this type of jurisdiction? Okay, thank you both for the, um, Roberto and Matthias, for your um, questions. Um, let me deal with um, Roberto's um, question on what I did not say. <laughs> um, I think, yes, there must be non-state law in Singapore that's being um, invoked and um, practiced by the people. Um, I must confess I haven't actually um, studied any of these um, non-state laws, but uh, the one that will come to mind will be canon law practiced by the Catholics. Um, I'm sure they have their own, um, I'm sure the Catholic Church and um, Catholic believers in Singapore have their own way of addressing um, certain legal issues or religious legal issues that have come uh, about. And so, whether or not, for instance, there are like Hindu courts, um, I don't think there are community community courts. I'm sure there must be some like um, ways of mediating disputes within religious um, organizations. Um, and one could also see them as being non state law, I suppose. Um, I think in the past, um, the, if you like, the Chinese clans um, used to also have their own sort of customs and their own ways of um, dealing with these customs. But um, the clans have sort of um, lost a lot of their influence and people no longer um, identify themselves according to these Chinese clans. And so I would see that uh, these customs have, have, as having largely um, faded away. Um, but that would be, I think, another... Um, type of non-state law that um, is also that has had, um, had that, that has had been practiced. 
at least in the past. Um, um, your second question was about um, the complexities um, of these um, systems, I think. Um, interestingly, actually, there were some cases where the British courts actually um, had to decide um, cases involving these Chinese clans. So, for instance, they were called to determine um, whether or not, um, or when there is dispute within the clan as to, for instance, um, inheritance or, uh, or property or um, whether or not a person's um, a person's um, second wife can be recognized and, uh, within the custom. The British courts actually did have to deal with some of these issues. And I believe that um, today, and unfortunately, I cannot recall any of these like post-independence cases, but I do know that, um, I, I do think that the courts will have to address these. And in fact, I suppose they would deal with them as if they're foreign law, which means that they have to be, um, you have to call an expert, the experts will have to introduce the various positions, and then the court will have to decide based on these positions. And in some ways, I think that that would also very much depend on how compatible these various positions are with the um, prevailing values um, that the court um, wish to uphold. Um, Matthias, with regards to constitutional principles, um, limiting the exercise of jurisdiction by Sharia courts, um, I suppose, I mean, generally speaking, the Sharia courts should be bound by the constitution in general, right? So for instance, um, they should be bound by the protections of fundamental liberties that are guaranteed under both constitutions. So um, in that sense, it, it, they, they, they should be subject to these constitutional principles guaranteeing fundamental liberties such as religious freedom, um, freedom uh, equality, um, uh, what else, uh, equality, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of movement, and so on. Um, the difficulty is that many of these, um, some of these laws actually would for instance, breach um, equality provisions. For instance, you know, um, inheritance laws in Singapore and Malaysia still recognize, um, uh, are still based on gender inequality. They recognize, um, they, they give different provisions according to whether you're a man or woman. But the constitution itself actually provides for exceptions based on personal laws. So there are all these complexities uh, that deal with that has to do with trying to accommodate religious laws and religious personal uh, laws within the constitution and so it's a it's a i think an ongoing accommodation that has to be done um specifically with regards to the exercise of jurisdiction well other than article 1211a which basically tells us very little um with respect to malaysia and article 153 which basically authorizes the state to do to enact laws dealing with religious laws, um, there's very little guidance as to how this should really affect jurisdictional um, allocation uh, in, in this legal system. Yeah. need to be in okay. striking distance of... Uh, all very flexible here, so you... Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, Jens? Yeah, please. We get going? Uh, sorry, please go. 
Okay, well, uh, let, uh, let me begin also by thanking uh, uh, the Faculty of Law at the University of Trento and uh, Roberto and Jens for having me here, not just for this conference, but for a very stimulating uh, three weeks uh, in this university, in this city, uh, teaching and getting to know uh, so many colleagues. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, and I really love this part of the world, and I can absolutely understand why there are so many interesting ideas about pluralism and jurisdictional diversity and accommodation of cultural minorities and language minorities uh, in this part of the world, and it's truly admirable. So thank you very much. Uh, now, this presentation, of course, uh, is designed as a contribution to uh, your very interesting research project on jurisdiction and pluralism, but in this case by examining issues from the standpoint of common law federations, this is my task, territorially organised. So my primary focus is on the organisation of the judiciary uh, in common law federations from the standpoint uh, of territorial uh, federations. Uh, in relation to the judiciary, as I will argue, in relation, uh, as with other institutions, federalism involves a combination of self-rule, in other words, divided rule with an element of autonomy, uh, and shared rule, uh, some combined uh, decision-making functions. And of course, as we've seen in the presentations this morning and in that very interesting presentation from Jacqueline, uh, federalism also coincides either coincides with or intersects with cultural diversity in a variety of ways. And that is certainly true across all the common law federations. Now, I'm not going to be specifically focusing uh, on those cultural differences, but I suspect that in the final paper, I'm going to have to try and deal with the lot. Uh, and that's going to be quite a complex uh, task. But uh, to go back to the point that Roberto has made a couple of times already today, um, we can't just stick purely with the legal rules, we need to try and see what's happening on the ground uh, to the extent that that's possible. So common law federations, which, feder which states are we talking about? Now states with federal systems broadly in the common law tradition, although of course some of these are formally mixed legal systems and a lot of them have other dimensions of various forms of legal pluralism involved. But states with federal systems that I claim fall within my remit, uh, Australia, Canada, India, Malaysia, Nigeria, Pakistan, South Africa, and the United States, and you're welcome to put in other bids, uh, if you like, uh, in the course of discussion time. I am going to touch on a lot of those states, uh, although not all of them, and mercifully, Jacqueline's let me off the hook as far as Malaysia is concerned because it's an extraordinarily complex uh, story. I have the United Kingdom on this list, not, because, not that I'm querying whether it's in the common law tradition, uh, but I am querying its federal status uh, at the edges. Uh, and also I'm acutely aware that other people are talking about at least some of these countries uh, tomorrow. But there's just a couple of quite interesting points about uh, the United Kingdom judicial system that I want to uh, touch on in my presentation. So this slide is designed to remind us about some of the characteristics of common law judicial systems which of course need to be accommodated uh, in any examination of common law uh, federal um, judicial systems uh, and it's possible that I haven't captured all the characteristics that I should and again you're, will you're welcome to add others. Um, but if I can go through the obvious ones that occur to me First of all, the, the bare sources of law include at least the constitution, if there is one, or in many cases, multiple constitutions, uh, include legislation, uh, and include the common law itself. Uh, and depending upon the state we're talking about, it may also include customary law, religious law that is formally recognized, or a variety of different forms uh, of law that are not formally recognized. Secondly, there is no distinct separation of public and private law. Common lawyers are always claiming to talk about public law, but by, by reference to the standards of 
civil law jurisdictions, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, there's, there, there is a body of law that's broadly called public and a body that's broadly called private, but the boundary between them is extremely porous. Um, and one consequence is that as a generalization, uh, the vast bulk of courts apply the whole of the law that's relevant within their jurisdiction of which the Constitution is merely a part. Generally, there is no specialist constitutional court. Of course, South Africa is in a way an exception to that, but in a way, I sometimes think that it's not because the way that specialist constitution of, constitutional court of South Africa has operated uh, has been to demonstrate how difficult it is to set up a specialist constitutional court uh, in, a common law in a common law country with a great deal of interaction between what that court does and the rest of the uh, legal system. And the final point under this heading is that although by and large these countries don't have specialist constitutional courts, of course they all have apex courts. In other words, courts at the top of the general judicial hierarchy, uh, which is the final court of appeal on constitutional matters. And if you're really interested uh, in the constitutional law of any of these countries, you're going to spend a lot of time looking uh, at the, at the uh, decisions of that body. And so while it's not a specialist constitutional court because it's drawing on all sorts of other kinds of law to resolve legal problems that come before it, uh, nevertheless, it's a very important court uh, with uh, a lot of constitutional responsibility. Of course, in these countries, there's a distinction between original and appellate jurisdiction. Maybe the definitions of those notions uh, have some common law characteristics, but we won't pause there. Of course, there's a doctrine of precedent structured by a court hierarchy, uh, subject to the possibility that Jacqueline identified of there being courts outside the hi hierarchy, there is a great premium placed on a significant degree of judicial independence. And that must be the case if you think about it. If you have general courts staffed by ordinary lawyers dealing with very sensitive matters against governments as parties and handing down mandatory orders against them. It is judicial independence is extremely important in those circumstances, as is the status of the judiciary, sometimes referred to uh, as the third branch of government. There are historic modes of protection uh, for the judiciary of judicial independence that go to the uh, way in which judges are appointed, uh, their tenure uh, in office, their remuneration in office, the difficulty of removing them. To some extent, those historic mechanisms of protection are breaking down or at least being supplemented by other ways of dealing with appointment and removal and complaints uh, and so on. But nevertheless, those uh, part of the backbone uh, of judicial independence and those are rules of a constitutional kind. Whether they're in a formal constitution or not, uh, they're, they're rules with significant uh, constitutional status. And in a federation, they may be protected by constitutions at both levels of government. Uh, as Debbie remarked this morning, there's no career judiciary. Uh, for the most part, judges are drawn from the practicing profession and that is uh, a feature that also feeds into judicial independence. The practicing profession itself is a pretty independent bunch of people. Uh, and then when they get to uh, appointed to a court, they carry with them those same norms, that same culture, and they expect to rely on the support uh, of the bar if times get tough with governments, which quite often they do. And then the final point on this slide, and I, this occurred to me as I was looking at the list of questions that Yen sent to me that uh, uh, he wanted addressed, although not necessarily in the order that I'm doing, Yen's, but uh, the question of language. I mean, the reality is that another characteristic of a common law legal system is that courts are likely to be, judicial proceedings are likely to be in, conducted in English. Certainly at the top, uh, of the hierarchy. Of course, there may be interpretation uh, of various kinds of the ways that we were discussing this morning, but the proceedings that normally are in English and the decisions normally are in English. And it's an interesting question why that's so, apart from the fact that the common law originated in 
uh, the home of English. Um, one answer, I'm sure, is the Privy Council and the fact that at one point in time uh, the common law was more or less unified across the common law uh, world. And another is that even now the common law is a very interrelated transnational system uh, with, for the most part, judges referring perfectly happily uh, to, to decisions of courts uh, in other common law countries. Uh, nevertheless, it's really weird. Uh, isn't it that if you look at that list of very different countries, for many of whom English is not naturally a first language, the idea that uh, most of the even vaguely higher court proceedings are conducted in English. And as I did a sort of a, a quick research attempt to see uh, to what extent there was variation from that pattern. Canada, of course, is variation from that pattern in the sense that uh, French is used throughout the judicial hierarchy, uh, at least in Quebec. Um, and um, India is to some extent a departure from it in the sense that it is possible uh, for uh, Indian high courts to get permission from I think the President of India to conduct their proceedings uh, in Hindi uh, and there's some doubt about whether other languages can be used at the high court level. I'm sure that at the much lower court levels, at the sub-national court levels where you're dealing with basic courts that are really interacting with the communities, there you are conducting business in a language that's not English. But as soon as you get to the levels where judgments are recorded and distributed and so on, uh, English cuts in. And I think that's a phenomenon that probably deserves uh, a little more investigation. Now, judicial organization across this wide range of federal type systems. Thinking about this for the purpose of this conference, I realized that there were a wide variety of different solutions which I have tried to categorise. But of course, if there are different approaches to this, then there is a question, why are there different approaches? And I think there's a multiplicity of answers to that too. Uh, and the answers are fairly common law answers. Sometimes it's a question of path dependency. Uh, why is the Australian system the way it is after Federation? Well, because it was a bit like that before Federation. Um, very often it's pragmatism, sometimes it's centralisation. What drives the difference between, say, Canada and Australia? A desire on the part of the Canadian framers to create a much more uh, centralised uh, federal system. But the various, the, the, the three principal categories of models that um, I think you can detect, and then, of course, with umpty two variations, are what I've described in a very sort of clunky way here on the slide, and I've also drawn in an even clunkier way uh, over there uh, on, the, um, on the paper. Um, first of all, there is what I've described as functional or perhaps horizontal dualism. In other words, uh, a way of structuring a court system in a federation that allows a system of courts for the federation itself and another system for each of the subnational orders of government. Uh, dualism, uh, but dualism by reference to functions. Uh, what do each of them do? Uh, well, they're given um, certain areas of government, certain uh, func aspects of jurisdiction uh, to deal with. Uh, so in that situation, there are distinct and parallel court hierarchies, the United States is the paradigm case, no particular joinder uh, between them uh, at all. And of course in, those, in that situation, within what is after all a single state, uh, there will be all sorts of logistical questions, you know, what do you do, uh, how do you, how do you make um, these two distinct jurisdictions interact with each other when it's necessary, uh, what do you do if you have uh, matters that somehow manage to cross those jurisdictional lines. There are all sorts of practical questions of that kind. Um, the contrasting model, and so that, uh, if you're able to see all the green over there, that's the model on the left. The contrasting model is the single line uh, on the right, uh, which is what I've described as vertical dualism, just to give it some sort of title. 
Um, and there you get a single court system, but a single court system that um, is divided between the orders of government uh, somewhere halfway down. So with the top part of the court system controlled by the, federated, uh, by the Federation and the bottom part of the court system uh, controlled by the long, lower uh, levels of government. And it's at that point um, that you might, might find a broader range of languages used, for example. And the federations that fall into that broad category include, for example, Canada, India, probably Nigeria, although I desperately need to talk to a Nigerian about this to try and see whether my instinct for what goes on there uh, is right. And then there is a third model, but it's not as common as you might think, a single court system under the control of just one order of government, and that is the South African uh, situation. Um, and no big surprise there, because that is a very centralised federation, if you regard it uh, as federal at all. Now, having identified those three sort of stereotypes, the reality is that almost all of them are a bit uh, mixed. And just to illustrate that, I'll take you in a moment to the complications of the Australian uh, judicial structure, um, but I might also touch briefly on the UK structure, which as usual defies categorisation. Um, but just before I leave this slide, let me say that quite apart from these hierarchies, there's also this problem of the one court that has cross-cutting significance, and that is the apex court. That is the court that is always controlled by the central level of government, but of course the subnational order of government also has very considerable interest in that court because that is the court that finally deals with the interpretation of the federal constitution on which all their powers uh, depend. Uh, and so I'll come back to that uh, court um, in due course. Now let me just briefly speak to you about Australia to show you how this mixed, mixed uh, um, structure works. Australia has very strong elements of functional dualism. In other words, very strong elements of having two parallel uh, court systems. And that's not surprising. Framers of the Australian Constitution pretty much copied uh, this part of the Constitution of the United States. So there are two systems of court, each of them exercising, to some extent, their own jurisdiction, federal jurisdiction for federal courts, state jurisdiction for state courts. But two important variations from the American model which have made a world of difference. One variation is they are joined at the apex, that's the little hat uh, over there on the, the two parallel lines on the left. They are joined at the apex by the High Court of Australia. The High Court of Australia exercises original federal jurisdiction. It exercises appellate jurisdiction from the federal court system. No surprises there, but it also exercises appellate jurisdiction from the state uh, court system. Uh, and um, that uh, is a very important characteristic of the Australian system to which I'll come back uh, at the end. Um, the other variation in the Australian system uh, is that state courts can be also vested with federal jurisdiction. Again, this was a nice pragmatic thing to do at the time of federation. You had state courts, you didn't have federal courts, they didn't want to spend too much money. Why don't we start off uh, enabling state courts to exercise federal jurisdiction. So there is that possibility of jurisdiction flowing one way from the federation to the state courts. There is no possibility of it flowing the other way because that's been held to be unconstitutional. Um, uh, so that again is a variation and that is a variation that continues. The state courts do exercise some federal jurisdiction but there is now a very uh, elaborate-ish uh, hierarchy of federal courts exercising the major categories of federal jurisdiction, and this is the court uh, to which Debbie belongs and the court uh, that she spoke about uh, this morning. The UK, let me just touch on it briefly, and John, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, 
Uh, if you think about the UK as a sort of a emerging federation or wherever you want to put it on the federal spectrum, different court arrangements for England and Wales, for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, it's impossible to generalise about them collectively, I think. Uh, but if we look at those categories uh, diff uh, individually, the courts of England and Wales are comprise a single court system under the control of the United Kingdom, but since the command paper that was handed down in February this year, even that seems to be changing with Wales breaking out as a, as a distinct jurisdiction. Uh, Northern Ireland, it seems to me, has some sort of a parallel court system broadly under Northern Irish uh, control, but with final appeals to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. And then Scotland, famously, also has a parallel court system, but a distinctive legal system with appeals to the United Kingdom Supreme Court only in non-criminal matters, meaning that criminal matters uh, end in Scotland. And there's a wonderful case that was handed down recently that's got everybody's uh, very excited, uh, on Twitter at least, um, where an English barrister has been ref refused the right of audience before a Scottish court. Uh, first time it's happened since the 16th century. <laughs> But as Scott's uh, lawyers are pointing out, uh, it works the, in, the, in reverse as well, so why shouldn't they do it? Um, and, uh, but it, the case then made me think, well, of course, if you're going to have distinct jurisdictions within a state, there will be these sorts of questions to be sorted out as well. How does the legal profession work? How do you ensure audience uh, by lawyers in the courts around the country, if indeed you want to ensure that? Um, now, my general argument in the paper is this, and it's fairly simple and in some respects pretty obvious. The, gen the federal character of, what, what, whichever, of the, whichever, judicial sol whichever solution you choose for structuring your judiciary in these federations, the federal character of the state plays some role. Now, that's obvious in relation to uh, any, either of those forms of dualism. With functional dualism, Obviously, uh, jurisdiction is divided between uh, the Federation and the states. With um, whatever that other one was I described as, uh, uh, the single line uh, of court systems, there again, there is a division. It just happens to be between the higher courts and the lower courts. But there is also relevance of federalism uh, and, and in that. And even in the absence of dualism, as, for example, in South Africa, the federal form of the state uh, may have administrative consequences. So will ensure, for example, that there is a high court in each of the South African provinces, even though the high court uh, is controlled by the centre. So there is some relevance. Federalism feeds into each of those uh, design features. But different choices for design create different challenges. So with either of those forms of dualism, you need to make a decision about where the lines are drawn. Which jurisdiction do you give to the federal court system? Which jurisdiction do you give to the state court system? Or if you're going to have a single court system but divide responsibility between the federation and the constituent units, where do you draw the line? And on what basis? What's the rationale uh, for that? And when you have shared courts, in other words, um, when you have a court system under which the central level of government uh, is controlling some of the courts, which are in essence subnational courts, um, how is participation there uh, made effective? Because my, I'm arguing that in such a system, uh, there is some subnational participation in the federal decision-making process or in the operation of those courts. But how do you make that participation uh, effective? So, for the remainder of the presentation, I just want to try and work those points through. So let's begin with the notion of functional dualism, those two streams of courts, and say how is jurisdiction divided? Then let's move to the notion of vertical dualism and ask how responsibility is divided between the orders of government. And then finally, let's think about those circumstances where one level of government effectively controls to some degree the courts of another, 
Uh, but, as I'm arguing, there is nevertheless a degree of subnational participation uh, in the constitution of those courts. And let's think about what are the options for participation. What might participation mean, this being a term I've stolen shamelessly from Jens. Um, and I think that there are three forms of participation that you can identify. One is consent through some sort of federal chamber. One is just consultation about appointments, etc. And a third is actually representation of the subnational legal system uh, in these shared courts. And the converse also is true, I will argue it uh, at the end. Uh, just as federalism has some implications for court structure, uh, so the choices that you make about court structure have some implications for federalism. Now, before I embark on that complicated technical story, um, let me just make all the usual comparative law uh, caveats. Of course, in all of these federations, uh, these, these are all very different countries. In all of these federations, the judiciary is organized in very different constitutional settings, including in all of those ways. Uh, in all of them, there may be other sources of law, formal and informal, which may affect the operations of the judiciary in practice in a multitude of ways. Uh, in all of them, there may or may not be multiple languages in use in the community, and those languages may or may not be formally recognised, and that may or may not feed into the court system. Federalism itself is underpinned by different dynamics. If you think of the effects that the Francophone province of Quebec has had on the dynamics of the uh, Canadian Federation and compare that with Australia, uh, for example, and then, of course, the rule of law may operate differently across these countries, uh, and logistics make a difference. You know, it's all very well to be comparing the relative luxury of the decision of the, of the docket of the Supreme Court of the United States with the docket of the Supreme Court of India uh, and drawing conclusions, but the reality is they've got such different tasks ahead of them that the comparisons are difficult. So all of these differences uh, affect comparisons between these states, but they also affect generalizations. So I will be generalizing, but of course, if I were to be talking about only one of these states, there would be a lot more uh, detail coming. So let's begin with the division of responsibility in states that have a functionally dual um, court system, the United States, and to a lesser degree, uh, Australia. How is jurisdiction divided? Now, the answer will always depend to some degree on the states and the, the priorities that they attach to what should be done nationally and what may be done uh, locally. But there are some forms of jurisdiction that stand out. Uh, the federal jurisdiction will always, uh, have responsibility for matters arising under the federal constitution. The federal co jurisdiction will usually have responsibility for matters arising under federal statute law. And as soon as I say that, then of course the, the federal division of powers feeds in uh, to this decision. Mm -hmm. They will almost always have responsibility for matters uh, judicial cases against federal officials. These are some of the most sensitive possible matters for federal jurisdiction, and you want them in your own courts. You don't want those state courts mucking around with these sensitive matters. Um, and a federal, uh, federal jurisdiction will usually include disputes between orders of government. Again, uh, for obvious reasons, you don't want that just in one subnational court system. And then it's possible to look at the converse and say, well, what are the typical categories for state jurisdiction? And they mirror the ones that I've identified for federal jurisdiction. If there is a distinct state constitution, and there is in more than half of these federations, then that will almost inevitably be a question of state jurisdiction. Uh, matters arising under state legislation, including very often matters arising in relation to common law, will be questions of subnational jurisdiction. Matters against state officials will be matters of state jurisdiction for the exactly the same reason uh, that apply to matters against federal officials. And then there may be um, other local matters of various kinds that you want uh, dealt with uh, at the state level. Now, of course, there are all sorts of other heads of federal and state jurisdiction you can add on. 
but those seem to me to lie at the core. And then if we move on to vertical dualism, the single line of courts, um, how is responsibility divided? Now, if you've initially asked that question, you say, oh, that's obvious. You know, you give the high appellate matters to the federal level where it can perform some sort of unifying role across the federation as a whole, and you leave lower trial-type matters uh, to the subnational courts. And probably as a rule of thumb, that's not bad. Uh, but actually, when you look at one of these federations in greater detail, it starts getting much more complicated. And so I use Canada here as an example. Um, the Apex Court, the Supreme Court of Canada, that, of course, is managed, if you can use that word in relation to a court, uh, by the federal uh, level of government. Uh, insofar as there are other federal courts, and there are sort of offered a tangent, they're the responsibility of the federal government too. But then, in relation to each of the Canadian provinces, there are two superior courts, a two-tiered superior court structure within each province, effectively playing a role for the province, also controlled by the federal government, in the sense that the judges for those points, the courts are appointed and paid by the federal government. So there's an example of the federation not only controlling the apex court with the constitutional jurisdiction, but also controlling the upper level of the provincial courts. Same thing in India, by the way. But in Canada, the sort of the oddity, I think, is that while they, the feds pay for the appoint and pay for the judges, the provinces provide the court buildings uh, and the, um, uh, provide the court administration. So there's a really unusual mix of responsibilities in relation to those top courts uh, in the provinces. And then but when you come further down the chain, the lower provincial courts are created and paid for uh, by the provinces. So those two slides are supposed to deal, admittedly at a very general level, with the way in which you would divide uh, jurisdiction um, when there is some sort of duality uh, in the structure. But now let's focus on that other aspect of the problem. Um, what happens uh, when... Um, one level of government, one court is controlled by um, one level of government, usually the central level of government, uh, but both the other um, uh, both the other levels of government, both the other orders of government have an interest in it. Uh, and this slide, I'm just sort of looking at it critically. Um, this slide is. Um, uh, dealing with the apex courts as well as other courts. Now, one option for participation, for participation of the units in some way in decisions about these courts in which they have an interest, is to require consent from the federal chamber of the federal legislature if there is such a body, and generally there is. As I'm sure you noticed when we looked at that list of federations at the beginning, they were a mixture of parliamentary and presidential style systems of government. Uh, and it is the case, I think, that there is no requirement for federal chamber approval in any of those parliamentary federations. Um, the, instead, the old style mechanism for appointment applies. Uh, in other words, the judges of, say, those superior um, courts in the provinces in Canada are appointed by the Governor-General of Canada, but of course in those circumstances the Governor-General of Canada is acting on the advice uh, of the federal government. Uh, and similarly, uh, there's a similar slightly more complicated situation uh, in India. Increasingly, uh, common law countries are beginning to create advisory bodies to take over from this purely executive function of appointing judges, but for the moment, a lot of these federations still use that mechanism. By contrast, if we think about the presidential federations that are co also common law federations, 
uh, the United States and Nigeria uh, in my list, uh, in both cases, there is some federal chamber approval. Uh, that's famously true in the United States, where the appointment of, say, a Supreme Court judge is always a, a cause celebre, although it's not a cause celebre that particularly has a federal dimension, uh, except insofar as the two sides of politics are divided uh, on questions of federalism. And in Nigeria, as far as I can tell, Federalism has some effect uh, on these superior court appointments through operation of what's called the Nigerian Federal Character Principle, and I won't stay to bother you with that now. My second possibility for participation uh, of the units uh, in decisions about these uh, courts in, with their, in which they're interested is through some form of consultation. Now, consultation, I claim here, is very is likely for federal appointments to superior sub-national courts in systems with vertical dualism, so the Canadian and Indian cases. So in Canada, for example, there are now judicial advisory committees in each of the provinces to make recommendations to the, to the, the federal government, which in turn gives advice uh, to the Governor General. And of course, there is some provincial participation uh, in those committees. In India, um, the President uh, is required to consult with the Chief Justice of India, the Governor of the State, and the Chief Justice of the High Court of the State uh, in making appointments uh, to the High Courts uh, in the various Indian states. Um, but that has been taken over by the Collegium system, to which I'll come back if I have time. Um, and consultation may also precede federal appointment to the apex court uh, where it has a significant uh, dual role. Uh, in Australia, for example, the High Court of Australia, the top court, exercises appellate jurisdiction from state courts as well as being the top constitutional court. The state should have a very great interest in the High Court of Australia. There's a statutory requirement for them to be consulted. I don't think consultation is much more than a bit of a phone call. Um, nevertheless, having said that, there is generally a reasonable spread of state representation uh, on the High Court of Australia, although there are a couple of smaller states that have never had a High Court judge. And there's some consultation also in the United Kingdom. And then the final option for participation is through actual representation of the legal system in some of these courts. And here again, we have some interesting examples. Um, in Canada, for example, uh, there's a provision in the Constitution that requires those appointments to the um, pro superior provincial courts in Quebec to be made from the bar of Quebec. So there's a constitutional requirement saying, uh, for those courts at least, the appointments have to be made from the Quebec bar. And then the Supreme Court Act, so it's only legislation, but it's important legislation, requires uh, three of the nine judges of the Supreme Court of Canada to be appointed from amongst the judges of named Quebec courts or to be advocates of the province. In other words, to be currently at the bar uh, of the province of Quebec. And by constitutional convention, fairly serious force uh, in Canada, the remaining six judges are divided between the big province of Ontario, the Western provinces, and the Atlantic provinces. Now, uh, am I running out of time, Ian? I, 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 won't, I won't take, he thinks so. I hate it when he does that. Okay, I, I won't take much longer, I promise. But I just have to tell you a few, just one war story. It's a really good war story. Um, so this is the recent NADON appointment uh, in Quebec, in uh, Canada. I don't know how many of you are following this very exciting story when it was happening last year. But uh, it happened when the Prime Minister... Uh, advised the Governor-General to appoint a certain person, Ms. Justice Nadon, uh, to the Supreme Court of Canada to fill one of those three positions uh, for Quebec because one of the, the retiring judge had obviously been a Quebec judge. 
And uh, it turned out that Mr. Justice Nadon uh, was a former member of the Quebec Bar, so he came from Quebec, but he'd been on a federal court uh, for 20 years. And so the question was, did he meet the statutory requirements under Section 6 of the Supreme Court Act? Well, clearly he didn't. Uh, and anticipating that problem, uh, the government caused the Canadian federal legislature to amend the Supreme Court Act to say it was all right uh, as long as you'd been a member of the Quebec Bar for a while. So then the question was the constitutionality of that amending legislation. So when the matter finally came before the Supreme Court of Canada, imagine the Supreme Court of Canada dealing with an issue uh, as sensitive as this, the Supreme Court said, no, sorry, Justice Nadon is not qualified uh, to be a member of this court. Under Section 6, he must be a current member of the Quebec Bar or a judge of the Quebec Court. And that uh, is a rule that has serious constitutional purposes. It secures civil law expertise on the Supreme Court of Quebec, and that's fair enough, performs a very important rule for, a role for Quebec. It ensures that Quebec's legal and social values are represented on the Supreme Court uh, of Canada, and it enhances the confidence of Quebec in the Supreme Court of Canada. All of those three issues, very important for the Supreme Court, so important that Parliament cannot legislate so as to remove the essence of what enables the Supreme Court to perform its constitutional role. Those sorts of values are now effectively constitutionalized, limiting the power of the federal legislature uh, to diminish them. Now, there's also an interesting war story about India, which I won't tell because I'm running out of time. But let me just finish uh, with this last uh, slide. Uh, this is dealing with the flip side. So what, all I've been talking about up until now is the implications of the federal form of the state for the way in which you structure your judiciary. But now let me think about uh, the implications of the way you structure your judiciary for the operations of the federated state. Uh, and let me make some generalizations and we can pick them up in question time if you like. Complete functional dualism of the kind that you find in the United States, of course, helps to preserve uh, unit autonomy. Uh, and to that extent, it facilitates diversity. And if we go back uh, to the point that the criticisms that Debbie was making of the, of the Australian Federation in comparison with New Zealand this morning, of course she's right. There is a great deal of difference across the country. Uh, and some of the bad practices are really bad, but some of the good practices are quite good. Uh, and so this is where federalism comes into its own, and sometimes you need to take the good uh, with the bad. But in any event, that's the Australian experience. By contrast, once you introduce the variations into the United States model of the kind that we see in Australia, you completely alter the operation of the Federation. So once you have a single final appellate court at the top, what happens? In Australia, the High Court of Australia says there is a single common law across Australia. There's no diversity in the common law of the various states, and we make the common law of Australia. Uh, and imposes precedential obligations uh, on the, all the intermediate courts, which I think has actually stymied the operation uh, of the intermediate courts, including uh, Debbie's court, but also the Supreme Courts uh, of the states. Uh, if you depart from that uh, organisational uh, approach to the vertical dualism, uh, plus representation of the kind that we see in Canada and the United Kingdom, uh, as long as you couple that with uh, some significant form of participation, uh, it seems that in a federal state that can be an interesting solution. Interesting for symbolic reasons, interesting also for practical reasons, insofar as it ensures some diverse expertise uh, in the apex courts. Those lesser forms of participation that I tried to explore uh, of variable significance in practical terms I think, and that last dot point I won't deal with because we didn't deal with India. So thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl, for this comparative, I would say, for, for this uh, comparative presentation with methodological rigor, uh, which uh, you worked your way through these different systems and uh, explained uh, in a seemingly very easy way, but uh, then in, a, in reality much more complex way, as you, as you did, uh, the peculiarities and, and the common features and differences of the common law system. So I'm sure that there, there is debate. I was also looking at Roberto already some flesh regarding uh, the, the structure. And I uh, take questions now for question time. I think we should give us some, let's see, 10, 15, if necessary, 20 minutes, and then we will have a coffee break, please. Matthias. Thank you very much for this brilliant analysis. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot from you. Uh, I'm not a great expert in, in the, in the uh, common law system. Um, two questions. First, one thing is always astonishing, that the question of the distribution of powers is at the core of federalism. And it's always a, a federal court which decides on it. it is, I think um, it's not, and normally the, the state courts do not participate. And the second thing is, I think, um, in a way, may I say, so it's a little bit provocative, the, uh, the branch of judiciary is the weak point in federalism. Uh, it's, it's inimaginable to have a federal state without own legislation in the states. It's inimaginable to have a federal state without an own government. But we can see, and we saw it here with the case of South Africa and also some other cases, where there's just a single court system. And nevertheless, we can speak of a of, uh, of a federal state, and we will hear the example of Russia, where very few uh, states court, let me say so. And this is very astonishing. And my question is, has this to do with the fact that, uh, 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 with the fact you mentioned before, it was very important, and it's a characteristic of judiciary, the independence. Um, the government's always political. The legislator is political, but the the, the judiciary, not, not, not really, I'm, I'm exaggerating, they are just interpreting the laws as they are. And so it's not that, okay, <laughs> you have doubts, but it's not perhaps not that important not to have a, a, a federal uh, uh, law, uh, judge or a, a state judge. Thank you. Thank you. Then there was Roberto. If there are is anybody else who wants to intervene afterwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I have four points, but I'll be very quick. The first one is a tribute to the comparative methodology of which uh, you are really a master. Uh, I, I think that every student, by being exposed to such a presentation, would understand better his or her own judicial system. And this is really, I would say, the, the, the magics of the comparative method and its great uh, teaching capacity. So, uh, as uh, Matthias also admitted, we all learned a lot, so thank you very much. Uh, and of course, this will raise even more the interest that we all have for the presentation by Ida Torres tomorrow concerning issues of international and supranational courts, because many of the uh, elements that uh, have been described today will apply in that context also considering in particular that uh, from the uh, Quebec K in, the, in Quebec, uh, you, you mentioned confidence. I wonder if you could say legitimacy as well, uh, because this would be one extra element, I would say, in the appraisal of a judicial system. In other words, in a compound, in a territorially compound system, and perhaps in a culturally compound system as well, there is, uh, I, I would say, an interrelation between confidence and legitimacy. And I wonder if you would uh, agree with that. And uh, finally, uh, I'm, uh, I'm always interested in what is not being said. And it seems to me that perhaps it might be uh, important to say something more about the role of the apex court, whether constitution or not, or uh, uh, to be played as umpire of the distribution of competences and powers and whatever. I think this point does deserve a little bit more attention because one of the rationale for having such a court is also uh, 
to be a sort of a, a, a green light or red light when it comes to the distribution of powers. Mm. And so I wonder if you uh, would care to say something more about that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I, I would suggest that uh, you have the chance to answer now because mm -hmm. otherwise it might get too complex and then we have two further questions already. <coughs> Yes, okay. Well, first of all, in relation to that first very interesting uh, question, you know, I'm tempted to say yes and no, um, because, uh, of course, it's uh, problematic in one respect that it's always the federal court that deals with the uh, division of powers, although part of the answer is provided by what Roberto just said, that those courts do go to some lengths to um, preserve uh, confidence in them, and yes, confidence, uh, legitimacy feeds into confidence. I agree with that. Um, but um, uh, confidence was the, the term that the Canadian court used. And it's more of a, of a giving notion. You know, uh, this court can be legitimate, objectively legitimate, but I've got to believe it's legitimate and have confidence in it if, to let it do that. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so, you're right that that is a, is a peculiarity. But I think that leaving that aside, and let's assume that it's somehow dealt with as a, as a necessity and by that court being very independent and sort of making the point all the time that it's independent. Um, otherwise, the relationship between the elected branches in a common law system and their courts is a very sensitive one. So I think I'm right in emphasising the importance of a high level of judicial independence. On the other hand, all of these um, orders of government like it to be their own courts that deal with matters against them. And why is that? Well, it's because there is some sort of idea that they're in some sort of organic relationship with each other. The courts are independent, sure, but at the end of the day, they rely on the other branches for appointments and money and jurisdiction and so on. Uh, and so it's all a delicate balance. And you see this balance really being played out generally most beautifully in the United Kingdom, I think, um, in the absence of a constitution. Um, so I think uh, there is a bit of a symbiotic relationship between um, courts and the elected branches in a common law system, which absolutely feeds in to supranational and international courts uh, when we talk about that tomorrow. Now, having said that, we had a very famous Chief Justice, uh, uh, still very highly regarded uh, in the, so the mid-20th century, who used to look at this com the complexity of the dualist court system in Australia and say, surely it wasn't beyond the wit of man to devise a court system that was neither common, commonwealth nor state uh, that merely uh, administered the law on behalf of everyone, which in a way is what you're suggesting, I think, but it's really, I think, impractical. As time has gone on and we've become, begun to understand a little bit better the way in which these relationships work, I think that that was always a bit of a pipe dream, but he, it was certainly a dream that was very passionately espoused. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I think this is um, already during the presentation and also now provoked by uh, Roberto's question. This brings us again to an overlap between the oh. uh, federal uh, and, and territorial compound and cultural compound system and to the issues of reflective judiciary, which we'll touch yeah. upon tomorrow. I was also thinking with regard to this relationship trust legitimacy, I, I will probably also deal with this in my presentation tomorrow because there is a question, as Roberto alluded to, with regard to minorities kind of formal legitimacy of the court, for sure, but what about substantial legitimacy in the sense of subjectively accepting also decisions, because there are systems which have developed over time in terms of conflict parallel structures, for example, because of non-acceptance of formal issues. But this is only uh, an anticipation. Uh, we have two further questions. Uh, please, Debbie, and afterwards, uh, Fred. <clears throat> if there are any other questions, otherwise, I would like to close the list, so think, and then look around. Please, Debbie. <clears throat> My question is about the workings of the common law in what you've been talking about. One of the traditional strengths of the common law is said to be 
the creativity and innovation it can give to judicial decision making. I'm interested in whether you have a view about which of the kinds of systems you've been talking about best advances that uh, attribute of the common law, its creativity. Mm. This is a very similar question uh, because uh, as you describe these different um, structures so so well and, 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 and so helpfully, um, my thought also was um, which of these uh, it, it may be more attuned to, to change and development, uh, to, to creativity. Uh, and I say this from um, the sense of, of a global uh, world in which change is occurring in various ways in which territories are breached and, and systems are, are responding um, uh, in various ways. And are, are, are some of these structures more flexible than others? Also, historically in the United States, one sees the, the flow of power uh, uh, was pretty much, very much from the states to the federal, with the courts playing a crucial role. But lately, meaning I don't know how many years, a long period of time, really. But you see much more mixed now, and much more, and and some of that may may be uh, a, a, a re restructuring of of internal power to reflect uh, other um, uh, forces. Um, and so which regimes, there's so many moving pieces, maybe creative lawyers in any of these regimes could, could, could reach good results, but I'm just curious as to whether you, you see one structure or another as being more or less flexible. Mm. Look, I don't think it depends just on structure. I mean, that's the other thing here. So I was thinking, as, as you both asked the question, and it's, the questions are related, um, I mean, logically, the answer is that the sort of system that you have uh, provides for the greatest opportunity for creativity because you have multiple players that are not all controlled by a single player. Uh, and so insofar as there is um, uh, still creative force left in the common law, and I think there is a very considerable amount of creative force, even if it's only in developing the principles of statutory interpretation, um, then I think that if you've got multiple sites for creativity, then um, that's going to be potentially more creative. Equally, it's going to open the door to some really wacky decision making, but you know, that's, that's you know, the swings and roundabouts that, w that we all know. Um, but having said that, then I, as I was, that was going through my head, then I started thinking about Canada. And again, even though that's on the face of it, a very centralised federal structure, um, the way in which it works in practice with significant consultation and respect for the different jurisdictions and the extreme diversity between Canadian provinces, not just Quebec and the rest, but Quebec and Ontario and the rest and then Alberta. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of diversity in Canada, which Canada has now come to accept as legitimate uh, in Roberto's terms. So I think there's quite a lot of potential for creativity in Canada. That's my, my, my assumption. So the real answer is where, the, where there's multiple heads, um, but I think it can occur elsewhere. I mean, that my disappointment with Australia really has been the, the way in which um, the single common law idea is okay as long as your one apex court is a pretty creative court, but if it's not, then that's the end of that. Um, and uh, when you even develop the rules of precedent to a point where your intermediate courts, particularly at the state level, are not encouraged to be creative, I think that's a bit of a problem too. I mean, even if you do want at the end of the day to have a uniform system, you might at least encourage a little bit of innovation of the really very smart people you've got on courts the next level down around the country, many of whom are responding to different contextual circumstances in their own state as well. And I think, uh, I just think it's a bit of a pity and maybe that will be reversed at some stage. 
Okay, thank you very much. I think this rang more than one bell, uh, if you say so in English, for many of the participants, but I don't want to anticipate too much. I already did so. Uh, thank you for this uh, very instructive <coughs> um, presentation and discussion. Uh, we have now we now deserve a coffee break, uh, definitely. I just want to make two announcements uh, from under of log logistical nature. One is uh, regarding the dinner tonight, because we have organized a dinner and those who want to join uh, and are not official speakers for bureaucratic financial reasons shall please tell me that I at least know the number and then we can, of course, um, include them. Uh, and uh, the second uh, point is regarding a certificate of participation, which uh, some participants need. Uh, this has been already prepared. It's just to be filled in with uh, Georgia Satori, you, whom you already knew. Okay, so then we can go to the coffee break. And most importantly, uh, let's be here at 10 past 5. Oh, bet you not. Yeah. <laughs> 10 past 5. This is, uh, yeah, we can. <laughs> okay, no, I don't say anything anymore. Thank you. <clears throat>